The subject of our session is an extraordinary book of the Bible, in many ways unique in all of the books of the Bible, as we will yet discuss, the book of Esther. Now, of course, as undoubtedly you all know, the reason for discussing the book of Esther right now is because the events described in the book of Esther come to a head this time of year, the celebration of the biblical holy day of Purim. Of course, as you know, and as we've discussed many times, while Purim is obviously a Jewish holiday, I prefer to describe it as a biblical holiday because while undoubtedly Jews celebrate this holiday, I believe it has a message to everyone who takes the Bible seriously, because it is, after all, the holiday that is introduced in this extraordinary book, the book of Esther. Now, there are a number of dimensions that make both the book and the holiday unique, indeed, extraordinary. I'd like to begin with a relatively recent development, where, of course, as you know, when I say recent, I mean recent by the standards of Jewish tradition. That is something that's recorded explicitly only less than 700 years ago is recent by our standards. Remember, the events described in the Book of Esther took place approximately two and a half millennia ago. The custom to which I'm referring here, which is truly exceptional and has no parallel elsewhere in Jewish practice, is a custom, I believe, first mentioned by Rabbi Judah, son of Eliezer Halevi of Mainz. Rabbi Judah was born in Mainz, Germany, around 1408, together with the rest of the Jewish community of Mainz, he was expelled from Mainz in 1462, whereupon he wandered to Padua, Italy, and was appointed rabbi of the community there and served as a rabbi in Padua for the rest of his life until 1508. We might well expect that after such a long scholarly career, he would have left behind a prodigious literary legacy. Undoubtedly he did. Unfortunately, however, for us, within a year of his death in battles taking place around Padua, his grave was destroyed and is lost to this day. And the overwhelming majority of his writings were deliberately torn and burnt in the course of these battles. Only around 16 responses to questions that pertain to Jewish law and practice survived and for our purposes. In number 15, he writes, quote, I'm translating, of course, from the Hebrew, regarding the matter of wearing masks, that young men and maidens, the old with the young, are accustomed to wear on Purim. Well, obviously, even though the responsum is from less than 700 years ago, he's referring to something that was clearly an established practice by that time. A practice that on manifold planes seems astounding, strange. He justifies it as permissible, but he doesn't explain 
what the origin of this custom is. So inevitably, that's a mission that I'd like us to take upon ourselves here, because I think it provides us with a fascinating and insightful in, in our considering what's taking place in this extraordinary book, Unmasking the Book of Esther and Purim. So, in attempting to link this very strange practice with the Book of Esther, inevitably, we need to ask, who in the Book of Esther is masquerading? Who's wearing masks? In answering this question, of course, we bear in mind what a mask is. A mask, after all, is a way of concealing one's true identity. Consider, if you like, the Lone Ranger, or more recently, Batman. So, in the Book of Esther, who is concealing one's identity? And there are plainly a number of answers to this question. That is, let's begin with the first one who is explicitly described as concealing her identity, indeed, the title heroine of the story, Esther, where in chapter two, in verse 10, we read that, Esther had not told of her people, nor her kindred, for Mordechai had charged her that she should not tell it. And even after the king loves Esther and sets the royal crown upon her head and makes her queen instead of Vashti, as we read in verse 17, still in all, in verse 20, we read again, Esther had not made known, had not told of her kindred nor her people, as Mordechai had charged her. So Esther, the Jewess, is concealing the fact that she's Jewish. She's not the only one who masquerades, because ironically, by the time we get to the end of the story in chapter 8, in verse 17, there are a lot of people who are masquerading as Jewish. There are a number of ways of rendering this verse, but the one that seems most consonant with the context is that we read in verse 17, many from among the peoples of the land professed themselves Jews. They didn't actually become Jewish, but they professed themselves Jews. They masqueraded as Jews, for at that point, the fear of the Jews was fallen upon them. Masquerading. Esther, disguising herself in order to conceal the fact that she is Jewish, the peoples of the land masquerading in order to conceal the fact that they aren't Jewish. More generally, we could note the singular significance of dressing up, what we might describe as costumes in the Book of Esther. Just consider two verses earlier in chapter eight, verse 15, that what signals all of the rejoicing in the story is Mordechai went forth from the presence of the king in royal apparel, a blue and white with a great crown of gold and with a robe of fine linen and purple, he gets all dressed up. And his costume is what prompts the city of Shushan to shout with joy. Earlier on, even more tantalizing, in chapter six, there's a question pertaining to dressing up that in the broader context of the story comes across as the first stage 
in what eventually leads to salvation. In chapter 6, verse 6, the king asks Haman, what shall be done unto the man whom the king desires to honor? Haman, presuming that the king must be referring to himself, describes the way he wants to be honored. And the way he wants to be honored, as we read in verse 8, is, let royal apparel be brought which the king used to wear. I want to be dressed in the apparel of royalty. Of course, that wasn't what the king had in mind. And after describing in great detail what he thinks should be done to him, Haman, the king tells him in verse 10, make haste and take the apparel and the horse as you have said and do so even to Mordechai the Jew. And of course, in verse 11, we read that Haman took the apparel and the horse and dressed Mordechai. So, dressing up, masquerading, concealment, plays a very significant role in this story. But now, to dig more deeply, what else is in a state of concealment in the Book of Esther? One glaring answer to this question is the land of Israel. The land of Israel that plays so central a role in virtually all the other books of the Bible doesn't appear in the book of Esther beyond one cursory implicit reference, Jerusalem, that appears so many times in the Bible, appears in the book of Esther only once. And that once is telling. When Mordechai is introduced in chapter 2, verse 5, we read the description in verse 6. Who had been exiled from Jerusalem with the exile that had been exiled with Yehoniah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. Well, I suspect that even without my highlighting the appropriate words in red here, it would be pretty obvious to us all what the dominant theme in that verse is. The number of times exile is repeated is staggering in just a single verse, as if to really drive home relentlessly the only mention that's going to be made here of Jerusalem of Judah, of the land of Israel, is in the context of its destruction and exile. It is, in a very real sense, in concealment in the book of Esther that happens someplace else. Well, the land of Israel, we should recall, is the place God calls my heritage. As an example, Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 7, I have forsaken my house. I have cast off my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. So, of course, if God's heritage is eclipsed in concealment, it should come as no surprise to us that so is God. The book of Esther, the only book of the Bible in which God's name doesn't appear. We have an ancient tradition linking the book of Esther with what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 31 in verses 17 and 18 describing the consequences of Israel's dereliction, I will forsake them and I will hide my face from them. In verse 18, 
I will surely hide my face in that day. What is inevitably particularly striking is the Hebrew. Haster astir culminates in a word whose spelling and pronunciation are almost identical to Esther's name, Astir. As if to imply that the whole message of Esther, the person and the book, is indeed concealment. God is in hiding. Indeed, again, God's name doesn't appear in the book of Esther at all. That is, it doesn't appear explicitly. The closest we get is a few tantalizing allusions. The most obvious of which, but it's not very obvious at all, is the words that spell out in Hebrew the Tetragrammaton by their initials. The Tetragrammaton, Yud, followed by He, followed by Vav, followed by He again. And what words are these? When Esther is inviting the king to her banquet, her private banquet, in chapter five, verse four, let the king and Haman come this day. And that, that of all things, is what spells out God's holy name. The king and Haman. The king, certainly by no means a paragon of righteousness and his wicked second in command. And they're the ones who by initials spell out God's holy name. I'll note in passing that there are three other even more elusive allusions to God's holy name. That is in chapter seven, verse seven, not by the opening initials of the words, but by the final letter of the four consecutive words here. We'll come back to this verse a little bit later on, God willing. And even more cryptically, in reverse order, we have the Tetragrammaton spelled out by initials in reverse in chapter one, verse 20, and in final initials in reverse in chapter five, verse 13. I don't think we're going to have time to address all of these instances. But of course, the point of emphasis is to appreciate that these really aren't references to God's holy name at all. So we have a book that doesn't even mention God's holy name. Just consider the challenge that that imposes upon us in attempting to glean some kind of religious message from a story in which God appears to be absent. And yet, in chapter 9, in verses 27 and 28, another extraordinary aspect of the book of Esther and the celebration of its holiday, Purim, we read, beginning in chapter 9, verse 27, that the Jews ordained that this holiday should not pass, that is, should not be revoked. And moreover, in verse 28, that these days will be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And these days of Purim will not pass, will not be revoked from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them cease from their seed. Purim is forever. Now, that's not to imply that 
other holy days are not forever. But in some sense, the implication is, since this guarantee is singular, that even if you could imagine some others not being forever, Purim necessarily is. It remains forever. It remains forever, but once again, we can't help but ask ourselves, forever commemorating just what? And inevitably then, that serves as a summons to us in our struggling to figure out just what this book is all about. In order to begin to get a handle on answering this question, maybe the first step is to consider the story from above, a bird's eye view. It is, after all, a drama unfolding. I feel compelled to share with you a short aside that I think is particularly relevant, especially if any of you have heard the manner in which the Book of Esther is read publicly in synagogues throughout the world on the holiday of Purim. And this inevitably brings to my mind memories of a class that I took as a student in Columbia University close to 40 years ago. One of the required courses was on the masterpieces of Western music, music humanities. And I can still remember our section of the course was taught by a dear older gentleman by the name of Professor Christopher Hatch, who guided us through the development of Western music, the kind of intellectual history of Western music, through selections that exemplified the development of Western music from its earliest roots. I still vividly remember the selection with which the course began. It was a recording of a group of Yemenite Jews chanting one of the Psalms. And as he remarked upon playing this selection to us, the reason that this was the starting point of the course is because all of Western music derives from the religious music of the church. Going back, of course, to the Gregorian chants as among the first samples of church music. But the music of the church had an earlier source yet, and that was the music of the Levites in the Holy Temple here in Jerusalem. Now, I have to admit that it wasn't clear to me at the time and still isn't clear to me exactly how he concluded that the manner in which Yemenite Jews chant the Psalms is the closest that we have today to the music of the Levites in the Holy Temple. Could be, I just don't know. But all of this led me to my own pet theory, if I may present it to you, as a kind of um, embellishment on what Professor Hatch told us all of those years ago. And that is, he was addressing the question of the origins of Western music. I'd like to address the question of the origin of opera. Whence opera? Why would one think of presenting a drama entirely in music? And here's where I return to the starting point, the manner in which the Book of Esther is read publicly in synagogues throughout the world. Indeed, whenever passages from the Bible are read publicly, 
as anyone who's been in a synagogue knows, they aren't read. They are sung. That is, in the Hebrew Bible, besides the letters, which are the consonants, and the dots that represent the vowels, there is a set of symbols to an untrained eye, if one notices them at all, they might appear as some strange squiggles above or below the words of the text. To a trained eye, those little symbols indicate how the word is to be sung. And the entire Bible is annotated with these symbols. So again, we don't read, we sing. And the entire book of Esther is sung. A dramatic story, sung. Sounds like opera. So using opera as a template, indeed, any dramatic presentation as a template, we consider what inevitably happens whenever a drama is performed. You take many events, events that in their original context may not even appear to be related. And you telescope them all together, of course, in the very tight time frame of the dramatic presentation. Which brings me back to the book of Esther and as an opening question to consider over what period of time do the events described in the book of Esther take place? Well, let's consider what the book of Esther tells us itself. We begin with the first date provided in the book, which is in chapter one, verse three. There we are told that the king's feast takes place in the third year of his reign. We move on to chapter two, verse 16. When Esther is taken into the royal house to the king in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of the king's reign. So obviously in the interim, four years have elapsed. Of course, we're not finished yet. The next chapter, in chapter three, we read of the event that gives the holiday its name, the casting of lots, where the lot in Persian, we are told, is the poor. Purim is the plural. And when was the poor cast? In chapter three, verse seven, we read in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of the king's reign. Well, that's nine years after the beginning of the story. Indeed, what's taking place in most of the book of Esther is taking place over the course of at least more than five years after Esther is crowned as queen. But consider that what unfolds from chapter three and on isn't really just nine years after the story begins because when Haman casts lots, he casts lots from the first month to the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. So the events of the book of Esther unfold over the course of almost 10 years. We can well appreciate that anyone living through these events would be very hard pressed to establish any linkage among the disparate episodes 
that the book comprises. But then you take this period of almost 10 years and telescope it into just 167 verses. And the book itself then, through the manner in which it presents the narrative, gently orients us to considering what the meaning is that's taking place beneath the surface. Now, before continuing, I submit to you that this very dynamism is part of one of the most crucial, foundational messages that we glean all together from the Bible. This is an idea that we've discussed previously, and it is perhaps best exemplified in Moses' song in Deuteronomy chapter 32, to which, of course, reference is made in the previous chapter, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, when we read in verse 19 that this song, Moses' song in the following chapter, may be as a witness for me, says God. In verse 21, this song shall testify before them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. Ironically, of course, in this warning is a phenomenal promise. The song won't be forgotten. Israel will never entirely lose its bond to God's word, to the Torah. But what exactly is the testimony in Moses' song? We've discussed this elsewhere. I submit, most crucially, it is the message that history has significance. There's something taking place on the stage of history. The world is moving to some goal. The world is being advanced to some ultimate goal. Everything unfolding in the world has significance because of that goal, because What's taking place on the stage of history is all orchestrated by that great playwright, the ultimate dramatist, God writing the book of history, God writing the script in which we are all players. Now, this is all in the background, but it's also implicitly in the foreground in the book of Esther. But since everything is masked in the book of Esther, of course, this isn't going to be stated overtly. It's intimated, subtle illusion, but it's there. And perhaps the most tantalizing intimation is what we read in Mordechai's warning to Esther in chapter four, when he senses Esther's reluctance to stick her neck out, in a way, literally, in going to the king unannounced to plead for her people. And so we read, in verses 13 and 14. Then Mordechai said to them to return answer unto Esther. Imagine not to yourself that you will escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if you altogether hold your peace at this time, then will relief and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will be lost. And who knows whether you are come to royal estate for such a time as this.
a charge that is rich in subtlety, indeed, even in mystery. Because when we consider what Mordechai is saying, we can't help but ask, how does he know? How does he know that if you keep your peace at this time, then will relief and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place? How does he know? Well, evidently, he knows. Because God promised. And since God promised that Israel will endure, and again, remember, this song will not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. They will be seed. Israel will remain. So there will be relief and deliverance from some other place. But you and your father's house will be lost. Now note, on the one hand, there is a mission that needs to be accomplished. Who's in charge of ensuring that mission will be fulfilled? Manifestly, the only possible answer to that question here could be, it's God. It's God who provide that assurance that relief and deliverance will arise from one place or another. Which leads to the inevitable next question. So why should Esther do anything? It's God's problem. If you keep silent, the salvation will come. The effect of your silence will be your own destruction. And who knows whether you are come to royal estate for such a time as this. What an odd question to ask. Who knows? But then we appreciate very well the answer. Who knows? God knows. After all, as we read in the first book of Samuel, in the song of Hannah, in chapter 2, verse 3, multiply not exceeding proud talk, let not arrogance come out of your mouth, for God is the Lord of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So, God is the Lord of knowledge. Who knows whether you have come to royal estate for such time as this? God knows. God is the Lord of knowledge. But note here, that doesn't absolve you of the need to act. Because while God is the Lord of knowledge, by him, actions are weighed. Whose actions? As we read it in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 19, God is great in counsel and mighty in work. But the consequences of God being great in counsel and mighty in work are his eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give every one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. That is, while God is great in counsel and mighty in work, everyone has a role to play in that drama. The great playwright casts his characters and we all have a role to play in what unfolds so returning to mordechai's words to esther you can choose and these words inevitably apply not only to esther but to each and every one of us you can choose to ally yourself with god's plan to be faithful to God's charge, to do your utmost to advance God's plan toward its blessed conclusion. And you will be part of God's plan. And you will advance the plan to its blessed conclusion. And not only that, you'll be advancing yourself. Because by making yourself part of that plan, in the manner in which you choose to ally yourself with God's plan, what you really achieve is your own salvation. Conversely, a person can also choose 
to do his utmost to thwart God's plan, to oppose God's plan, to keep it from advancing to its final conclusion, ironically, he will also advance God's plan to its final conclusion. Just in the process, he will be successful in destroying himself. He won't be able to thwart the plan. He won't even be able to sit out of that plan because while the choice is in his hands, what role he will play in the divine drama unfolding in the world, one choice he doesn't have. He cannot choose to be insignificant because God put him here. He is significant. He does have a role to play. And having a role to play means whatever he does, he's going to advance God's plan to that ultimate conclusion. He is significant. But in his choosing just what kind of significant role he will have, he chooses whether to serve as an agent of his own salvation or his own destruction. As one way or the other, he advances God's plan. Obviously, what that presumes and what the Bible makes abundantly clear is that ultimately whatever happens is part of God's plan. It all, after all, comes from God. Now, we've discussed this previously. This does lead to what we might regard as an unsavory conclusion, but an inescapable conclusion. As God expresses it in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am God who does all these things. And likewise, in the prophecy of Amos, in chapter 3, verse 6, shall the horn be blown in a city and the people not tremble? Shall evil befall a city and God has not done it? The rhetorical question that invites the answer, everything comes from God. There is none else. And likewise, the same rhetorical question in Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 37 and 38, who is he who said, and it come to pass, when God does not command it? Out of the mouth of the Most High proceed not evil and good. Everything comes from God. Everything comes from God. Of course, not in the sense that God pushes us to evil. But God, in creating the world as we have it, creates the potential for evil. That we can, by our actions, choose to actualize or not. We've noted this in other contexts. But it's a good example to recall in understanding Mordechai's message to Esther in much the same vein. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8, when you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you not bring a liability of blood upon your house. Now, reading the Hebrew, literally, if the fuller from there falls. Now, what exactly does that mean? If the fuller falls, he hasn't fallen yet. Why are you calling him a fuller? And in our tradition, the implication of referring to the one who is going to fall because of the homeowner's dereliction in not putting the railing, the parapet, around his roof has already been designated as a fuller. By whom? Well, of course, 
by the only one who makes these designations. As we read in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4, who has wrought and done it? He that called the generations from the beginning, I, God, who am the first and with the last am the same. God designated the hapless victim of the railingless roof to be a fuller. Because again, there's only one author of that divine drama. And that is the one who forms light and creates darkness, who makes peace and creates evil. It all comes from him. And yet, still, if you fail to put the parapet, the railing, around your roof, you have brought a liability of blood upon your house. Because again, you choose. You choose if you want to become part of the drama in the role of one of the good guys who through your positive decisions advances the divine plan or one of the bad guys who perforce through the wrong decisions will also advance the divine plan but in the process destroy himself whatever you choose however you're going to be in the play you're in the drama as expressed in proverbs chapter 26 verse 10 we've noted this verse is amenable to a number of interpretations but to translate perhaps most literally great is he who performs all and we know after all who performs all the one who forms light and creates darkness who makes peace and creates evil the one who performs all god and in performing all he hires the fool and he hires transgressors he hires everyone everyone will have a role to play in that drama everyone is significant and simultaneously in a way everyone is a mask a mask concealing the master playwright god the author behind the scenes consider in this vein again that closest to explicit reference to God's holy name in the book of Esther. Of course, it's not explicit. But the initials, remember? Let the king and Haman come this day. The holy name, the tetragrammaton, the yud, followed by the he, followed by the vav, followed by the second he. And it's let the king and Haman come this day. That's the way we intimate God's holy name. At this point, the answer should be clear. Yes. That's what this world is all about. God, ultimately, is the one who is in hiding. I feel compelled to share with you, we've noted this in the past as well, that the Hebrew word we use for world is olam. We've noted on many occasions that all of biblical Hebrew is predicated upon three letter roots. The three letter root of Olam is Alam, Ein Lamed Mem, which means concealed, hidden. Because the world is a realm of hiding. God is concealed behind the scenes. Again, we reiterate Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 18. And I will surely hide my face in that day. So we read the book of Esther and lurking behind the scenes all the time is 
the one who wrote the script. Hints, signs abound, but we never see God coming out explicitly. It's always behind the scenes. I think this also helps us to understand the extraordinary parallel that we find between two passages that, of course, in terms of their implications, are diametric opposites. What we read on the one hand in chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, and on the other hand in chapter 8. In chapter 3, verse 12, then were the king's scribes called in the first month on the 13th day thereof, and there was written according to all that Haman commanded unto the, the king's satraps and to the governors that were over every province and to the princes of every people, to every province according to the writing thereof and to every people like their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and it was sealed with the king's ring and the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces with a message to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women. And one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is in the month of Dara, and takes the spoil of them for prey. And this is the decree that is promulgated in verse 14. Now we skip to chapter 8, beginning in verse 9, structurally, we read almost exactly the same narrative. Of course, the date is different, but then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, which is the month Sivan, on the 23rd day thereof, and there was written, now it's not Haman anymore, of course, according to all that Mordechai commanded, unto the Jews, even to the satraps and the governors and princes of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, 127 provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people like their language. Almost exactly the same words as we found in chapter three. Of course, in this case, also, and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. And again, written, and sealed with the king's ring and sent by couriers. But now, of course, the message is that the king had granted the Jews that were in every city to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy and to slay and to cause to perish all the forces of the people and province that would assault them. Now, it's not to destroy, to slay, to cause to perish the Jews, but to do the same to their enemies. Also, on exactly the same date, upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. And again, this decree is published and promulgated. There is, of course, a dramatic irony in exactly the same words being used in two diametrically opposed contexts but on a deeper level. In chapter three, what we read ostensibly is that there was written according to all that Haman commanded. In chapter eight, there was written according to all that Mordechai commanded. The parallel between these passages guides us to the realization Haman isn't issuing any commands here, and neither is Mordechai. The only one issuing commands in reality is God, the one who's hiding. We just need to strip off the masks to be able to discern that lurking behind those masks, the mask of Haman, the mask of Mordechai, ultimately, the one who really truly is in charge is the great author of the whole drama. Now, 
considering this message that the Book of Esther is all about stripping away masks is, I think, the critical key of understanding altogether why this strange book of the Bible is part of the Bible, even though God's name doesn't appear. Where's the religious message? The religious message is you need to be able to discern God's hand, God's presence, precisely where it seems to be concealed. We all do. We need to learn to strip off the masks. And it's on that plane that I'd like to consider together with you, in particular, three very concrete applications of how we strip off masks, not only in the story of Purim in the book of Esther, how we need to keep on stripping off masks in our lives to this day. Application number one, in Haman's indictment, in chapter three, verse eight, his first words, without, of course, identifying the Jews by name, are, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. How is this in and of itself an indictment? Because the people that are scattered and dispersed has lost the sense of its mission. It's lost that abiding sense of what unites it together. And we know ultimately what needs to unite that people together. They are charged with a mission to be God's witnesses, to communicate a message to the world, even when the world is unready to hear that message. But when they're scattered, when they're dispersed, they aren't communicating anything. How do they become scattered and dispersed? You know, ironically, when people deep down are the same, they can still fail to recognize the kinship that bonds them together if everyone is wearing a different mask. And if all you see are the masks, you see, for example, a mask that looks like Haman, a mask that looks like Mordechai, and you think everyone is different. You need to strip away the masks to reconnect with that core message that binds us all together to God and unites us all. Not surprisingly, what Esther bids Mordechai do as a prelude to her coming before the king to plead for her people is go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan. They need to be gathered together. They need to find an antidote to being scattered and dispersed. They need to reconnect. This isn't only a one-time fix on an ongoing basis. It's interesting to note that in chapter nine, among the observances of this extraordinary holiday, in verse 22, we read that the Jews are bidden to make them, make these days of the 12th month of Adar, days of feasting and gladness and sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. There is no other holiday that is observed specifically by sending portions one to another. Gifts to the poor, of course, is the commandment to support those who are in need every day of the year. There's a special commandment in the book of Esther to send gifts to the poor. But moreover, there's a special commandment that has nothing to do with poor. Sending portions one to another is simply means for enhancing the feeling of camaraderie on an ongoing basis to fulfill that mandate of go and gather together 
all the Jews. Everyone needs to gather together. We need to strip off the masks that separate us. We need to realize there is more that unites us. Of course, you know very well that for me, this message is critical when we consider all together what we're doing right now. Because one of the verses in the Bible to which I return fairly relentlessly, Zephania chapter 3, verse 9, for then will I turn to the peoples a pure language that they may all call in the name of God to serve him shoulder to shoulder. That's not just talking about Israel. That's all peoples. Because ultimately all peoples need to appreciate there is more that unites us than that separates us. And it's precisely on that basis, we've discussed this many times, that when the entire world recognizes that from Zion goes forth Torah, God's teaching, and the word of God from Jerusalem, when everyone recognizes there is one goal, there is one focal point, then inevitably, as we read in the verse that follows, that was Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, in verse 4, they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. Because when we realize there's only one goal, different missions, different routes to take to reaching that goal, but one goal, conflict becomes absurd. And what God charges us to strive to achieve, ultimately, God does it. That's what we read in these words of Tsefania. But as in all of the words of the prophets, what God tells us he will do, in effect, he charges us to strive to do, to stand shoulder to shoulder, to call together in the name of God, serving him together. That's the summons of stripping off masks. That's summons ultimately of coming together. That's our first concrete application of stripping off masks. Ultimately, of course, what this is all about is our stripping off the mask and seeking God. I feel compelled to share with you an idea that we have enshrined in our tradition. It's maybe a strange kind of idea, but of course, one of the most common words in the book of Esther is the king. Often, the king is explicitly identified as King Achashverosh, Aswerus in transliteration, the king of Persia. But many times, it would appear just stylistically, we simply read the king without any further clarification as to the king's identity. Well, of course, you could say, we don't need to identify which king it is. We know. After all, there's only one king who is described repeatedly in the story of what's taking place here, which is true, but have an ancient tradition when the king is identified explicitly by name we're referring to the king of persia where we just read the king it refers not only to the flesh and blood king of persia it refers also to the supreme king the king of kings the holy one god I have the stress here. When you read the story of the book of Esther with this born in mind, it can completely transform the whole picture. Stripping off masks, seeking God, ultimately is the most crucial message 
we need to glean from this story. There is an old Hasidic story told of an elderly rabbi who has a young son. And one day, while the rabbi is immersed in his studies, his young son comes running to him in tears. What's the matter? What happened? And the child relates that he was playing hide and seek with his playmates. And when it was his turn to hide, no one came seeking. No one came looking for him. Whereupon the elderly father bursts into tears himself and says, isn't that not just your problem, my son? Isn't that, so to speak, God's problem that he's hiding and we're not seeking? As we read in Isaiah chapter 65, I availed myself to be sought to them that asked not for me. I availed myself to be found to them that sought me not. I said, here I am, here I am, unto a nation that called itself not by my name. I spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people that walk in a way that is not good after their own thoughts. He's begging us. Here I am, here I am. But are we seeking? And that, more than anything else, is the summons. Don't stop searching. Stripping off masks isn't the job only for Purim, and not only when we're reading the book of Esther. All of life is our attempt to learn these lessons, to keep on stripping off masks, to find God. And you know, simultaneously, there's something that is profoundly reassuring in this reality, because that means that if we just keep on stripping off the masks, everything can change completely. After all, that's what happened in the book of Esther. As we read at the beginning of Esther chapter 9, in verse 1, in the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, on the 13th day of the same, where the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have rule over them, whereas it was turned to the contrary. Everything was turned upside down, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. Everything can be changed. In the blink of an eye. Uh, but that brings us to the third crucial con concrete application of what we're saying, that stripping off masks. Indeed, it happened suddenly. Could be the blink of an eye, but whose eye? An important cautionary note. As we read in Psalm 90, verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night, the blink of an eye can last a long, long time. And here we return to a theme we've discussed elsewhere in Esther chapter seven. And this really is terrifying. In the episode at Esther's banquet, when the king asks, who is this and where is he that presumes in his heart to do so, to destroy your people? And Esther unmasks 
evil. In verse 6, an adversary and an enemy, even this wicked Haman, evil is unmasked. And we might be expecting that the moment that evil is unmasked, it loses all its power. And that's not what happened. On the contrary, in verse 7, we read something truly terrifying. And the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and ran into the palace garden. He's gone. The only one left with Esther is Haman. The evil unmasked now has nothing between him and Esther. And it seems that She's at the mercy of evil. Wasn't it supposed to be different? Didn't we think that when evil is unmasked, it disappears? But no, the one who disappeared is the king. And again, I remind you, the king isn't just the king of Persia. It's the king of kings. Evil is unmasked. And it seems to us that God is nowhere to be found. But then we always need to read deeply when we realize we're reading a book of masks. The end of verse 7. Haman saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. The king is someplace lurking behind the scenes. And indeed, as we noted earlier, it is in precisely this verse that we find again God's holy name lurking behind the scenes. Even further behind the scenes than when we spelled out God's holy name in the initials the first letters of consecutive words. Here are the last letters of consecutive words, but still it is. The Yud, followed by the He, followed by the Vav, and followed by the second He. So the king seems to have disappeared. He's really there. And of course, inevitably, we recognize that what happens next in verse 8 is, then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and that's it for Haman. And Haman was fallen upon the couch whereon Esther was. Then said the king, will he even force the queen before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face, and Haman's face is covered not merely as a mask, but as the end. And in the next verse, the king instructs that Haman is to be hanged, and the verse afterward, they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordechai. It really is just a blink of an eye. But that blink of an eye for Esther could really have seemed like an eternity. All the more so for us when we don't know how long that divine blink of an eye, so to speak, lasts. We've discussed this elsewhere. We saw this as well at the end of the previous exile, the first exile, the one in Egypt. When God sends Moses to redeem the people, and what does his appearance immediately accomplish? Well, as we saw, what it immediately accomplishes is negative. Pharaoh says, you shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof. Let heavier work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein. And we read in verse 12, so the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. 
more torture, more affliction, more suffering. So much so that in the continuation of chapter five, the officers of the children of Israel who are being beaten see Moses and Aaron and they say, may God look upon you and judge because you have made our savior to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses himself loses heart. In verse 22, Lord, wherefore have you dealt ill with his people? Why is it that you sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt ill with his people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. What even Moses didn't see, what he couldn't see, was that this sequence that appears again to be God in hiding is the darkness that comes right before the dawn because there was that impediment for redemption moving forward that tacit complaint of the Egyptians. What did we do? Why should we be suffering? It's all Pharaoh's fault. The people who is so abusive to their afflicted slaves that they won't even give them the useless straw left in the fields now has no excuses. And all the divine fury of the plagues will be poured out upon them with no further delay. God says to Moses, the next verse, at the beginning of chapter six, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh for by a strong hand, shall he let them go and by a strong hand, Shall he drive them out of his, his land? And that brief interval, God hiding, was really the harbinger of the redemption that follows. Now, there is obviously a certain common element between that and what we read in chapter 7 in the book of Esther. But it's only to a degree. And this is the final note upon which I'd like to conclude with you. Because, you know, what happened, of course, what God was intimating in chapter six, verse one, is the wonders, the unprecedented, unparalleled grandeur of the miracles of the Exodus. As we read in the prophecy of Micha in chapter seven, verse 15, as in the days of your going forth out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. The marvels of the land of Egypt are in a category unto themselves. And indeed, on some plane, a harbinger of what lies ahead. Except that, truth is, what lies ahead in the redemption of the future is so great, so wondrous, even the grandeur of the Exodus is eclipsed. We read in Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, Behold, the days come, says God, that it shall no more be said, as God lives, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as God lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. That is, the degree to which God will be revealed in the future will be far, far greater than the miracles of the Exodus. And of course, inevitably, to that extent, we realize if we're talking about the drama of miracles, the drama of God's hand being revealed for all of the world to see it. Well, the Exodus from Egypt was merely a preview of what yet lies ahead. There are times when indeed God is so dramatically revealed. There are times when we see his hand and are overawed by the greatness, by the majesty, 
by the splendor. Those are the times that in the turn of phrase of Psalm 92, we can declare God's loving kindness in the morning. The times that, like the morning, are all bright and sunny, shining and clear, we declare God's loving kindness because we see it so dramatically revealed. That's not the book of Esther. Because, let's face it, in the book of Esther, even after the masks seem to be stripped away, does God become explicitly noticeable? Is God's name in the end going to be revealed? No. You can go through the entire story And if you so chose, you would never see God at all. You can go through the entire book of Esther and God remains in the shadows. There is no manifest miracle. There is no dramatic morning that's bright and sunny that enables us to sing of God's loving kindness. Rather, in the same turn of phrase of Psalm 92, verse 3, there are the night seasons when we declare God's faithfulness. We don't speak of the loving kindness because we're not seeing it. We see something immeasurably more sublime, more subtle. And as a result, ironically, more everlasting. Because there is the drama of the great miracles, but the drama of the great miracles will eventually be eclipsed by even greater miracles. But then there's learning to discern God's hand even when he's hiding. There's learning the art of stripping off masks which is an ongoing challenge and remains an ongoing challenge. And maybe on that note, returning to a point with which we began, remember Purim, uniquely, singularly Purim, must be forever. These days will be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city. These days of Purim, will not pass, will not be revoked from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them cease from their seed. Because while dramatic miracles can be eclipsed by greater miracles, learning to discern God's hand, even in a world of concealment and olam of hiddenness, is a lesson that we always need to learn over and over and over again. So when we consider in summation, what are we supposed to get out of this strange book, strange holiday, the book of Esther and Purim, that don't even seem to reveal God's presence at all. So where's the religious message? Precisely there, stripping off the masks. So when we ask, in finality. So where was God? Ultimately, we realize the answer is he was there all along. We just had to strip off the masks, open our eyes, see. I have set God always before me. Surely he is at my right hand. I shall not falter. That's the real celebration. Again, in Psalm 16, continuing with verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also dwells in safety. We're sustained by that faithfulness that we saw even in the night seasons. 
and Purim teaches us how to see that concealed face of God behind the mask, stripping away the mask, and recognizing that in stripping away masks, we're able to discern the greatest blessing. God bless you.